Are they unlucky? Are they unwanted? Are they weak and vulnerable and lost? Are they good people who've had bad breaks? Are they con artists, losers, alcoholics and drug addicts and thieves? Are they hard workers who can't find jobs? Are they lazy? Are they bad kids from good homes, good kids from bad homes? Have they been neglected, abused, discarded? Are they the leftovers, the forgotten ones, the brokenhearted? Are they decent, dignified, liars, quitters? Are they mentally ill? Have they squandered every chance? Did they ever really have a chance? Yes, the answer is of course, yes, to all of it. A thousand homeless, a thousand stories, a thousand reasons. Good, bad, right, wrong, everything in between. Don't look away, don't avert their gaze, it's too late for that. Look into their eyes and think to yourself, there, but for the grace of God, go I. There are three sounds that stir our souls, that make us stop to reflect and remember what it feels like to be human. The sound of taps played on a bugle. The sound of children laughing. And this. This is Florence Rigney. Her friends call her Cece. Cece's getting up there, but she still drives to work two or three days every week. Way back in the day, at the end of the war, World War II, she was a nurse. Of course, a lot has changed since then, but one thing remains a constant, and that is the stunning fact that Cece Rigney, who entered nursing school in 1943, is still very much a practicing nurse at Tacoma General in 2016. How many years now for you in this business? Well, I've been a nurse for 70 years. 70 years. 70. Just look at her. She's a blur as she prepares an operating room. I can't stand not doing something. She pulls stuff and pushes carts and moves pillows and gets things ready. She just doesn't stop. Cece is the oldest working nurse in all of America. And I'm glad and I'm very thankful and very, I feel very blessed to be able to do this at this age. 91. 91. Wow. There's another nurse in Indiana who's 90. She called up Cece one day. When she called me up, she said, we're the two oldest working nurses in the country. I said, I've got a year up on you. Last year, they had a 90th birthday celebration for Cece. And one of my co-workers put it on Facebook, and then it went viral. I don't do Facebook. My granddaughter said, Grandma, it went viral. Well, it was crazy. Think about the changes she's seen. When I first started working on pediatric, they just started using penicillin and sulfa. And you know, what a change. So far I've walked um, 3,511 steps. I sometimes walk three miles. The other nurses can back that up. CC runs circles around people, people half her age. We actually have people running from CC. When CC's coming, they run because they know CC's gonna put them to work. <laughs> Both of her husbands have left this world. She has kids and grandkids, and of course, the kids here at Tacoma General. It is amazing working with Cece. She's one of the greatest women I know. I don't know, she, I don't think she likes to be bored. She keeps busy, she wants to help people. She's a wonderful nurse. You told me that the end is in sight? Maybe next year, I think so. Paula, my supervisor, said I could work for or if I wanted to, but <laughs> I think one of these days. <laughs> think of the cumulative effect, the thousands of patients, the millions of kind words and smiles, and all of the joy and heartbreak. I'm gonna have to go out and volunteer and do something. Because I don't think I can just sit home and do nothing. 
you can only go to lunch so much. <laughs> 70 years of surgeries and flu shots, scared kids, bedpans, thermometers, and all the rest. How incredibly generous of her. What a gift Cece has given the world. Cece? Yes? You're my hero. Well, and you mine too for the news. I enjoy <laughs> watching. The stuff, the heroin and the booze, the meth and the painkillers and the dope. How powerful is it? How good is the stuff? Good enough to give up everything for it. Love and hope, the past and the future, children and their love, a roof and four walls. To give up those things, the stuff must be very, very good. I tried it, I got addicted to it, I felt, I felt the high, I felt good. I didn't, I didn't stop. They'll do its bidding. They'll steal for it, lie and cheat for it, even die for it. The stuff is good, unbelievably good, and then it is bad. Gut churning, teeth rotting, soul shattering bad. But by then the love affair has been cemented, and to turn away from it, to break up with the stuff, hurts more than anything. <laughs> An old Chevy hubcap, an old photo of a guy in his car, an old drinking fountain from the 50s. All just tiny parts of a living, evolving mosaic, a cluttered, kaleidoscopic quilt work of American life called Triple X Root Beer. This place is the goodness of what we were looking back at us through the prism of time. Big food, great tunes, good times. Oh, man. It's really good stuff. Every weekend there's a car show at Triple X and all different kinds of people, black, white, Hispanic, you name it, speak the language of the automobile. Had more torques than any uh, production engine in the world that year. Check that out. Oh, he got that, that, that flathead V8. Check it out, dude. A every everything works except the horn. Jose and Ciso built this place from nothing. Remember that hubcap? There's a story there. I didn't have nothing to do with the decoration. It just happened. The guy brought me a hook tip. Hey, here, want to put it up? Right there. That's the very first item that was brought in here, very first item. And remember that guy in his car? Another story. You're here somewhere, Eric. And it's my favorite picture. You look like Bruce Springsteen. It's, oh, right here, right here, right there. Right there. I love that picture, Eric. I just love it. <laughs> and that old drinking fountain, there's a story there too. Only this one is different. We used to mi be migrant cotton pickers, you know. And, uh, and so, you know, this was back in Texas, which in, at that time it was, it was really racial. I mean, it was open season, you know. They followed the crops. Unwelcome in motels, they slept under their truck unwelcome in restaurants and grocery stores, somehow they may do. You know, since we couldn't buy groceries to buy lunch when we were traveling, what my, my, my dad and the crew would do, the, the, he would stop to the side of the road and all the men would get off and, and they'd go hunt rabbits. And so all the women would, would take, uh, you know, the cotton branches and make fire. There is one story that is etched into Jose's mind like a tattoo and will live there forever. One farmer gave Jose's dad a few acres so he could grow his own fruit to sell it on the side of the road. We went to this big, remember this huge big church, and my dad parked his pickup and he put the candles, opened the, the lid in the back, and we had candles like that, so we were all excited. And then they started coming out of the church, you know, and we got ready. And, and I remember, you know, a bunch of, uh, white guys, men, drove up on a station wagon and, and they got off and they started screaming at us and calling us names and cussing and stuff and, and we freaked out. I mean, we didn't know what was happening, you know, us kids. But my dad knew. So what my dad did, he braced us and he held us, you know, he covered the lady. So, so what these guys did, they grabbed the melons and they threw them on the ground and took it and they started throwing them at us. I remember seeds all over the place and sticky. You know, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I mean, it was uh, like a uh, mental, like, crash. We, we didn't know what, you know, church, coming out of church. <laughs> you know? 
And there was something else. Jose says that in those parts, in those days, Mexicans weren't allowed to use drinking fountains. They drank instead straight from the spigots. And so at Triple X today, that porcelain fountain is a private symbol hidden in plain sight. And the spigot that's been placed behind it is no accident either. Just a reminder, you know, to keep going. Uh, endured, endurance. So how is it that this man of all men would build this temple to the very time and the very nation that wounded him so deeply? Maybe the giant root beers are his answer to drinking fountains he wasn't allowed to use. Maybe the giant burgers are his answer to the daily rabbit for lunch. Maybe the welcoming hospitality, the cheery sweetness of this man. Maybe that's his answer to the rejection and confusion he faced as a boy. And maybe all of it, the whole celebration of Americana, the cars, the flags, the memorabilia, maybe it's all just that kid in Texas still trying to prove something, trying to prove that he's an American. Somehow I, I you know, I gather my own strength, you know, and, and continue pushing forward, pushing forward. And, you know. And, and yet, you obviously love this country. Oh my gosh, I love America. Yeah, I love our America, yeah, yeah. I told him that to me, he's an all-American boy, maybe the most all-American boy I've ever met. I became an all-American boy. I proved myself to be an all-American boy. I proved myself to love this country. I worked for it, I worked for it. So when I say I am an American, you know, Mexican-American, you know, without leaving aside my culture, my race, you know, I'm an American. I will always be an American. So perhaps we've had it all wrong about Triple X root beer. Maybe this place isn't a celebration of what America was, but rather what it always wanted to be. And maybe somehow that's been Jose's point all along. Jose, you're my hero. In another time, he could be a rogue cowboy blacksmith, forging crude horseshoes and shovels in a ramshackle barn. But here and now at the crossroads, where junk meets up with genius, in piles of rust and dust and steel, where gears and gadgets and remnants of the industrial age have gone to die. The artist that is Dan Klenert sees things he can beat on and cut at and weld and bend to his iron will. He sees a kind of beauty. This one here, if you look at this, it looks like a squirrel, don't it? The body, the head, the start of a tail. You get a whole life ahead of you, right? Yeah. I plan on living it fully as best as I can. profound gratitude as a guiding life force. I didn't know the man, but I know this. At 2.50 in the afternoon on March 9, 2013, at the very instant that Jay Usatalo fought against the laws of physics and the human instinct of self-preservation to thrust his body on top of Aiden Hubbard as his plane plummeted to the earth, at that instant, he touched something that only a tiny chosen few ever touch, a singular moment of perfection and grace.